Here we are, continuing through the Gospel of John, John chapter 10. Um, as I say with every chapter, this is a beautiful chapter. The entire Gospel is beautiful. And so let me invite you to take out your Bibles and turn with me once again to John chapter 10, verses 14 to 21. And while I'm happy that Advent is upon us, I'm sad to be leaving the Gospel of John uh, during the time of Advent. So this will be our last sermon before Advent from the Gospel of John. Our focus for today will be in verses 10 to 21, and that can be found on page 1065 of the Pew Bible in front of you. I think it actually goes to 1066 as well. And as you turn there, please note that I've titled this sermon, The Good Shepherd, Part 3. And it's really important that as we read the Gospels and we, and we see an area of Scripture where Jesus is focusing in on the specific thought, it's important for us as confessing believers to try to dissect that, that, that thought in digestible portions so that this way we can squeeze out every bit of pulp from the words of our Savior and Lord. And so if you have that out, let me invite you to rise once again for the reading of the infallible, inerrant word of the living God. Jesus speaks these words as he continues through this allegory that points directly to himself as the good shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father." There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon. It's insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Let us pray. Oh God, our God, yes, we know that these are not the words or the actions of a demon. The demons seek their own glory. They seek to kill and to steal and to destroy. But you, Lord Jesus, you seek to give and to give abundantly, to give eternal life. And so we thank you for coming down and being our good shepherd. We pray, O oh God, that you would open our minds and our hearts now by the power of your Holy Spirit to illumine them with your word that through this time of proclamation, O oh God, you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would be glorified. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. So Jesus, over and over again, in fact, three times says, I am the good shepherd. You have probably heard this before. In fact, there was a movie that was made with the title, The Good Shepherd. And sometimes when we hear things over and over again, when we hear statements over and over again, we kind of become numb or deaf to their meaning. When we break these words down, I is referring to a specific individual. Good, re re referring to the attribute of that individual. And then, of course, shepherd, one who leads. And so they say, okay, I got it. Jesus called himself a shepherd, okay? He never really shepherded. He was a carpenter, but okay, he's calling himself the shepherd. I get it. We're the sheep, okay? We follow him. But sometimes things are lost in how we look at the words of Christ. For instance, this word good, we're going to look at that word. We're going to unpack that word today, and it's important that we do in order to understand how Jesus is not just the good shepherd, we would have to translate it in our language in order to say, no, Jesus is the great shepherd, the shepherd par excellence. There is no other shepherd like Jesus because the word good that Jesus is using here has a greater meaning than we could ever understand. 
And so let's think about that for a moment. Jesus is the good shepherd. What does that mean for those who are following Christ as his sheep? Well, it means three things, beloved. It means three things. And I want to explain those three things this morning with the first word, trust. Because Jesus is the good shepherd, you can trust in him. And not just with some things, not just with things of faith, but with all things, everything in your life, you can trust to Jesus. Why is this important? Because many of us have issues with trust. And we've got to ask ourselves, why do we have issues with trust? Well, because people have let us down. We have let ourselves down. Sometimes we can't even trust ourselves, right? We get into certain situations. We say, whoa, whoa, whoa I got to pull away because I can't trust myself in that situation. That is sometimes a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. And so we see that trust among human beings is something that, just like happiness, ebbs and flows. Sometimes our trust is at a very high level, and when someone lets us down, our trust is at a very low level. And when our trust is at a low level, we treat everyone else the same. We distrust everyone. I've heard Christians say that over and over again. I have problems with trust. But let me say this, when you are trusting in Christ as your good shepherd, then you feel a deep sense of freedom to allow yourself to trust others as well. Even if you know that there's a high propensity that they will let you down. I've had to learn that myself. I've had to learn to trust people even though I know they may let me down. And when they do let me down, it doesn't bother me as much. Because I know how we are as human beings. I know that maybe one day I may let you down. And so my hope and my trust is in Christ. And I hope that your hope and your trust is in Christ as well. Because he will never let you down. We read of this over and over again throughout the scriptures. But somehow we forget it. So I want to remind you this morning. And I'm going to go specifically to Psalm 94 with all three of these things that the good shepherd gives us. Look at Psalm 94 verse 14. It says, For the Lord will not forsake his people. He will not forsake you, the sheep that he has gifted to his son. He will not forsake you. He will not abandon his heritage. Do you see the connection there? God is saying, you are my heritage. You are the inheritors of my forgiveness. You are the inheritors of the glories of Christ. Therefore, I will not abandon you. And Jesus says that his will and the Father's will is the same will. And therefore, you can trust in Jesus that he will never, as the good shepherd, as the glorious shepherd, will never, ever let you down when you trust in him. Here's the second blessing that we have as Jesus being our Savior. Security. Security. Everyone wants security. We insure ourselves sometimes so that we feel secure. Right? We buy a home, we buy a car, we put insurance on it, not just because the state requires that we do or a bank requires that we do, but we want that insurance for we know that if a problem befalls us, we can be secure that someone's going to pick up that tab. But we also want security in life. We take vows in marriage. Why? Because we want to feel secure that that person has promised to love us. Sadly, however, we let each other down. But know this, putting your trust in Christ, you can have a security that will never let you down, that will never forsake you. You are 100% secure in Christ. He's going to speak about that as John chapter 10 continues. He's going to speak about how he holds you in his hand, how the Father who's great and all holds them in his hand. So you, beloved, can feel secure in as Jesus being your good shepherd. Remember, he said, I'm the door. He says, before anything can befall you, it has to come through me. Paul says that we fight principalities, right? That our fight is against the spirit realm. Well, guess what? Before they can take you down, they got to go through Jesus. And Jesus will strengthen you so that you feel secure against the enemies. 
going back to Psalm 94, verses 16 and 17, says this, Who rises up for me against the wicked? Well, it's simple, it's God. Who stands up for me against evildoers? If the Lord had not been my help, my soul would soon have lived in the land of the silence. That is, in the land of the dead. When I thought, my foot slips. Your steadfast love, O Lord, held me up. From time to time, beloved, our foot slips. As we go throughout life, sometimes we, as our Baptist friends would say, sometimes we backslide. But you can feel secure that Christ will always bring you back. The third word that describes the gifts that we have in Christ as our good shepherd is peace. Peace, oh, what a beautiful word. And we're going to look at that word in greater depth as we go through Advent. But know this, peace is something that Christ gives us that the world cannot understand. Because you know that in Christ you have a shepherd over your soul. You have a shepherd that's leading you so that you can go in and out of life situations knowing that he has got you hemmed in on all sides. You are not only secure, but you are so secure that you're able to live in utter peace, in great peace, in a peace that surpasses all understanding. Doesn't that give you comfort? You only have that because Christ is the good shepherd. Once again, I take you back to Psalm 94. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolation, your consolations cheer me, cheer my soul. Think about that. When the cares of my heart are overwhelming, when, when life gets too difficult, I know that I can get through it because I have the peace of knowing that you, O oh God, that you, Lord Jesus, are my shepherd. This is why Jesus uses that imagery, even though he never shepherded physically a flock. This is why he uses the imagery of the good shepherd, the tender shepherd, the loving shepherd, the shepherd that cares for his sheep, that wants nothing from his sheep other than to see them flourish. He wants to give us nothing but peace. In fact, this is what Jesus will say later on in John 14, verse 27. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. In other words, the world's peace, just like uh, trust and, and, and security, it ebbs and it flows. But the peace of Christ remains. And therefore, he says, let not your hearts be troubled, ne neither let them be afraid. Right? So I ask you today, are you experiencing the trust, the security, and the peace of the good shepherd? Again, this is one of those questions that we've got to ask ourselves every morning because each morning brings with it a new season of aggravation sometimes, right? We look at the political scene. We look at the economic scene. We look at our own jobs. We look at the issues within our families, and sometimes we feel unsteady. Sometimes we feel like we don't know what to say, what to do, how to react. And that's when we've always got to go back down to our knees and pray to our good shepherd. Why? Because it is him in whom we can trust. It is him who gives us the security, the understanding of how to go through the difficult times in our lives. And it is him who lets peace run over us like rushing water. This is why he is the good shepherd. This is why that word good seems inadequate on the surface. I would actually say it seems inadequate in the English. And so it's a word that we have got to look at, and we will, in the Greek, to understand the magnitude of what Jesus is saying here, because he's more than just a good shepherd. And when you understand that, then you will begin to experience him as the good shepherd. And so let's look at the Gospel of John. Let me draw your attention to verses 14 to 16. And then, then we see that Jesus shows us that his attributes of shepherding are vastly different from that of anyone else, right? Jesus' form of shepherding is a shepherding of the soul. 
right? And when the soul is good, when your soul is healthy, when it's trusting in God, when it's strengthened in Christ, when it feels the sense of peace that the the Savior, the, the shepherd is walking before me and he's leading me, then you begin to understand that he's unlike any other shepherd that ever existed. And so Jesus begins here with, I am the good shepherd. Please note that this is the fourth of the seven I am statements that Jesus made in the gospel of John. The first one was, I am the bread of life. He made that statement in John chapter 6. What you're saying is, if you feed on me, you will feel so enriched that you realize that all you need is me, that you will have spiritual strength in order to live out your life. He went on in John chapter 8 to say that he is the light of the world, that as we walk in him, as we trust in him, that we will be illumined to see the world around us, to understand the world how it really is, that we'll be drawn back to Scripture in order to see the world through the light of of Christ. In John chapter 7 earlier, he said, I am the door. We spoke about that last week. He is the door through which the sheep must come. He is the door that stands between us and the enemy. He is the door to salvation. You cross over the threshold of Christ in order to enter into eternity. Later on, he's going to say, I am the way, and that connects directly with the fact that he is the door to salvation and security. And here he says in John Well, he said it earlier last week, but he says it here again in verse 14. I am the good shepherd. And here's where we need to really look at this word good. The word that's normally used for good in the Bible is this word agathos in the Greek, agathos, which really when it's defined means morally good. We see that in Luke chapter 18, verse 19, when Jesus was approached by the rich young ruler. He said to teacher, he said to Jesus, teacher, we know, or he says, good teacher, we know that you're a man sent from God and so on and so forth and everything else. What must I do to inherit eternal eternal life? And Jesus says to him, why do you call me good? And it's not that he's saying I'm not good. But he's asking him, why are you calling me? Why are you calling me agathos? Because agathos means morally good. Right? It means I am full of morality. There is nothing immoral in me. Now, if you look around at other teachers, there are many teachers who appear to be good, but they are not morally good. Do you understand? Now, as human beings, as, as, as English speakers, we kind of confuse this word good. We say about people, oh, he's a good guy. right? But if we use the biblical language and we say, wait a minute, is he a completely moral guy? Is he a perfectly moral individual? Well, no, we have to take that back. He can sometimes be a good guy, but that doesn't line up with the biblical form of good, agathos. Sometimes we say that, oh, that was a really good meal. Really? What is, was it a moral meal? Right? Maybe we can say that about communion, right? That was a good meal. And so the reality is that with the, with, with the, the derivation of words, we as human beings, especially as Americans speaking English, we take words that, that mean something greater and we use them very frivolously. So the reality is when we say, you know, when we want to talk about a person, we should say, well, he's a nice guy, you know? He's someone who's helpful. We should use other words in order to describe these individuals that we're speaking of. When we taste a meal, We should say, that was a very tasty meal. It was very flavorful. I enjoyed it, rather than saying it was good because it wasn't moral. And that's really, when you look at the word good, yes, again, it's the the definition has derivated over the years, but the word good means morally good, morally stable, meaning it doesn't change. It remains good all the time. Now, when we think of the word good that way, then we say to ourselves, wait a minute. I stand with Paul. I stand with the writer of the Psalms. No one is good. No, not one. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so when Jesus calls himself the good shepherd, he's saying, I am something that you have never seen before, that you have never experienced before. But let me say this. This is not the form of good that Jesus is using in these verses. Jesus is using a greater good in these verses. 
Jesus is using this word kalos, kalos. That's a different form of good. This word kalos speaks to excellence, moral excellence. So it's, it's taking the regular good, agathos, and it's raising it to the superlative. So Jesus is saying, I am kalos, shepherd. Not just any shepherd, because I know you people have dumbed down, you've watered down this understanding of good. I am greater than that. Let me show you what this word means. And these are just a few of the examples. And I know it's small on the screen, so I'm going to read it to you. Beautiful, of good quality or disposition. Fertile, rich, useful, profitable, excellent, choice, select. It is pleasant, delightful, just, full measure. Honorable, distinguished, uh, possessing moral excellence, worthy, upright, virtuous, what is good and right, a good deed, right, duty, benefit, favor. That's just a few of the uh, definitions of kalos in the Old and the New Testament. So what Jesus is saying here is, I am something greater than you have ever experienced in your life. And this is not boasting in himself. This is the reality of who he is. So he says, I am kalos, shepherd. I am the beautiful shepherd. I am the good shepherd. I am the morally excellent shepherd, which is to say is you can trust in me because I will never leave you ast- I will never lead you astray. I will never leave you abandoned. When you have problems, call on me because that's what I'm here for, to shepherd you through your life. This is where we get the saying about Jesus, this word kalos, when we call him the good, the beautiful, and the true. That's the good that refers to Jesus as shepherd. He's the good, the beautiful, the true, the everlasting, the never fading, the always enduring shepherd. So he says, with this understanding in mind, I am the good shepherd. I am the beautiful shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. And we've got to connect the end of 14 with 15 because he's, he's connecting the, the knowledge of us with the knowledge of himself and the knowledge of the Father. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And he's saying, I'm drawing you as the good shepherd. I'm drawing you into this relationship with me, the same type of relationship that I have with the Father. I want for you to know the Father as I know the Father. And one day that will happen, beloved. One day in the glorious presence of Christ that will happen. We will know the Father as the Son knows the Father. But from now he's saying, I am inviting you into that relationship. But know this, the Father knows you just as he knows me. Which is to say, the Father knows exactly what the sheep need. The Son knows exactly what the sheep need. God knows what you need. Before we ever go to God in prayer, he already knows what we need. And he's already working in our lives to bring what we need to pass. He's always working. This, way you, this is why you can be secure in the good shepherd. This is why you can trust in him. This is why you can have peace. That even if he doesn't answer my prayers now, he is working to answer them in his timing for our good. As the shepherd leads the flock, he gives them what they need in the great timing that they need it. And he's saying here, I know my own and my own, they know me. Can you remember a time when you didn't know Christ? Can you remember a time when you, when you were embracing everything else in the world? That may have been a time when you felt insecure, when you felt like you couldn't trust, when you felt like you had no sense of peace. I remember those times in my own life. And those are very uncertain times. It makes you question everything. Why am I even alive? Why do I exist? But after coming to know Christ, and as you begin to read about him and, the, and what he offers his, his sheep, you begin to understand, yes, I do have purpose in life. I can trust in the word of God. It is the infallible inner word of God. Because at that point, you begin to think God's thoughts 
after him. That's Christ drawing us into that relation that we may know him and know the Father as they know each other. He's speaking here of intimate knowledge. Intimate knowledge that unbelievers don't have. That's why they're unbelievers. Intimate knowledge that is only bestowed upon those who have come all the way to Christ, who have been drawn to Christ, who have been opened in their hearts to understand their need for the glory of Christ. And then he says this, and I lay down my life for the sheep. What a turn of events, huh? Here he's talking about drawing us closer and closer to the Father and and bring us into this deeper relationship. And then all of a sudden he says, and I'm going to die. Well, this is the way that he seals that relationship. This is the way he seals our entrance into the throne room of God by laying down his life for the sheep. Isn't that interesting? You have the shepherd who's supposed to be taking care of the sheep being the very one that is laying down his life for the sheep. Now you may say, well, if you lay down your life for the sheep, who's going to take care of the sheep thereafter? Well, he's got that one figured out as well. But here it is, the shepherd becoming the sheep. And these verses speak of the definite atonement of Jesus Christ, that he allowed himself to be arrested He allowed himself to be convicted. He allowed himself to be beaten, to be scourged, to be laughed at, spit upon, to be ridiculed, to be publicly humiliated for you, for me. Everything that happened to Jesus, we deserve. He didn't deserve it. He is altogether beautiful. He is the good. He's altogether glorious, altogether lovely, altogether true. He didn't deserve any of that, but he did it so that we can have a relationship with him and the Father. And the only way that that was possible was through his definite atonement. He knew where he was going, and he was willing to take that trip without any coercion. And not just for the Jew, but also for the Gentile. You see, if this would have ended right there where he says, I die for the sheep, then it would have left our salvation open-ended. We would say, well, wait a minute. Does he mean us as well? Oh, you better believe he does. And this is what he says in verse 16. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. So the first sheep that he's speaking about, that is Israel. And then he's speaking about this other group of sheep. That's me and you. And he says, and I'm going to draw them together. Notice he says here, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. In other words, they're scattered everywhere else. But I, as a good shepherd, am going to draw them in to this relationship. And he says here, at the latter half of verse 16, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. This is the effectual calling of Christ. When he calls you, you will come. When you hear his voice, you will know in a heartbeat that that is Jesus calling me. And you will come all the way to him. Notice he says here, I must I will, without a shadow of a doubt, as my mom used to say, this will happen. I must bring them. I am compelled to bring them. And they will listen to my voice. When Christ calls someone, he calls them effectually, and they will come. And then he says here, so there will be one flock, one shepherd, one flock, one joining together of Jew and Gentile for the glory of God. Isn't that beautiful? Think about us as human beings. This is so beautiful because us as human beings, what do we do? We don't bring people together. Every, every, every so often when we get to an election cycle, it's usually the issue of there's so much division, there's so much division, and this person, they're going to bring us together. I remember during um, one of the election cycles, one customer that I had, he's a fellow from England, and he says, you know, America, every time they go to elect a president, they act like they are electing the next savior, (laughs) you know? And it's true, right? It's true in a sense. We act like, now, 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 
Now if we have a Republican, now if we have a Democrat, or maybe one day if we have an independent, now we're all going to be united. It's nonsense. Because in our sinful nature, beloved, as human beings, we don't unite. We actually divide. We divide for many frivolous things. And yes, you know, uh, things of this world are frivolous. But the things that matter are spiritual. And Christ says, I'm going to step in and I'm going to unite every tribe, tongue, and nation. Only Jesus, amen. Amen. Only Jesus can unite. If we're looking for someone else to unite us, it's not going to happen. It may happen for a short period of time, but it's not going to happen. But the one person that unites us, infinitely unites us, is Christ. Because he is the good shepherd. And he is guaranteed that he will draw us all together. Verses 17 and 18 speak of the divine power behind the divine act of kalas. Choice goodness, beautiful goodness, and agape, which is um, agape, I should say, which is a wholehearted love. He says here in verse 17, for this reason, the Father loves me. So he's going from shepherding people, right, being, saying that he's the good shepherd, and he's drawing all people together, and he's going to lay down his life for them. And then he says, for these reasons, the Father loves me. Right? And he's speaking about that it's not like the father did not love him before. Oh, the father infinitely loves the son. But this is speaking to the work of the son. The father loves the works of the son. And here's the reason why. Because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. And this is important for us to understand here. Jesus is saying here, I have the power to lay my life down, which is also to say, I had the power and the authority to never lay it down to begin with. I had the power and the authority to leave you to yourself, to leave you to the wolves, to leave you to the bad shepherds, but I chose not to. For this reason, the Father loves me because I was willing to sacrifice myself in line with the will of the Father. It's not like the Father had to coerce the Son. He had to talk Jesus into it. It's not like they drew stars to see who would go and die for the sheep. No, Jesus wanted to from all eternity. From as, he was, as he was the agent of creation, he knew that one day he would also be the agent of salvation. Because I laid on my life that I may take it up again. And notice here, he's speaking about his deity. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Right? You remember when Jesus was before Pilate? He was speaking about his own authority. Remember Pilate was trying to say, hey, listen, Jesus, give me something to work with here. I don't think that you're guilty of all that they're saying about you. But I need something. I need some evidence. I need some proof. I need some type of argument in order to set you free. It appeared by all exterior you know, evidence that Pilate wanted to set Jesus free. He just needed Jesus to help him, right? And Jesus tells, and, and, he, and, he, and he tells Jesus, you know, I have the authority uh, to, to, to set you free or to, or to condemn you. And how does Jesus reply to him? You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above, right? In other words, you have no authority. It is my will to lay down my life for my sheep. It is my will to be crucified for my sheep. It is my will to take the beating for my sheep. You have no authority over me at all. And we know that because of what he says here. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. I have that authority, that complete authority. And it's interesting because you know what? Usually someone who has all the authority says, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to take the hard road. I have the authority. Jesus could have just dismissed our sins like that. But the Bible says that there's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. That man must pay for its sins. And Jesus says, I'm going to be that atonement for you. That's how much I love you. That's how much I care for you. That's why I and I alone am the good shepherd. 
And then he says here, this charge I have received from my father, right? And sometimes we think about that, you know, the father kind of bending the arm, son, the son's arm. No, he's saying, this was the will of the father and it is my will as well. This is the, 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 the commitment that the father gave me. This is the, the, the order that the father wanted me to fulfill. And please note that because God is eternal, this was the plan from eternity past. And here's Jesus in real time living it out, knowing that he would endure the pain and the suffering for you and I. There is no other shepherd like him. Which brings us to verses 19 to 21. And here we see, as I mentioned earlier, truth divides because it leads unbelievers into deeper blindness. So Jesus is saying all these things, right? If you were a religious leader at the time, I don't know, I'd be kind of shaking. I'd be like, this guy's speaking a lot of things. It sounds a little bit cryptic. I think we need to ask him some more questions. Do they ask him more questions? No, they don't ask him more questions. In fact, let's listen to the words that they use to describe what Jesus has said. It says here in verse 19, there was again a division among the Jews because of these words. You would think that there would be unity among the Jews because of these words. But no, there's division. And this division is not necessarily something that's leading some to trust in Jesus, as it might appear in the verses as we continue, but it's actually making them, sti- they're, they're, they're sticking to their original opinion of him, but just looking at it in different ways. And the first opinion is this. Many of them said, this man has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? And it's almost like they're trying to dismiss what he just said out of the minds of all the people gathered and listening to the words of Christ. And that's how it is, beloved. That's how it is throughout the world. As you stand there and you, and you, and you study the, the scriptures and you, and you try applying them to your life, you try living them out in real time, people are going to tell you there's something wrong with you. What is wrong with you? That doesn't work in this. You know, go back to your church, go back to your little Bible study, go back to your prayer group and save that for them. But in the real world, we handle things a little differently. We handle things with a lot more reality. Well, you know what? There's a reality that's coming, beloved. And that reality is in the person of Jesus Christ. One day he will return And he will shut every mouth that is spoken against him. And he will bend every knee before him. And so we as his faithful sheep must stand firm in who he is, in what he has taught, and what he has left behind for us. So here's what they say. He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? And then others, of course, said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Right? Now, there is truth there, but this truth doesn't appear to be leading anyone to a saving knowledge of Christ. Why? Because this truth is is, is something that that, that they're speaking, but it's not something that they're believing. And in their hearts, they're saying, there must be another reason for why he can do what he can do. It's not a demon. We know that. It's got to be something else. It can't be God. We know that. It's got to be something else. And that's what unbelievers will do. They'll say over and over again, you know what? I I, I know I don't know what that means, but it doesn't mean what you say it means, right? And this is kind of what's happening here. But I want to remind you, based on these words, why this whole Good Shepherd thing started. But please note that the the fact that this Good Shepherd uh, discourse would come out was all in the predetermined plan of God. So how did it all start? The healing of the blind man. Jesus and the blind man. He walks by this blind man. This blind man's just there minding his own business, just living his life. Not a very good life because if you're blind, you don't get any braille. There was no braille at that time. You're basically a beggar. And you're relying upon the grace of others to give you money, to give you food. And usually people would just give you food and clothes and things like that. And this this throwaway of society is just kind of standing there on his own. And Jesus comes over and he heals him. He didn't cry out to Jesus. He didn't say, Jesus, please come and heal me. But Jesus came anyway. And that's how Jesus comes into many of our lives. I didn't ask for Jesus to come into my life the night that I believed in him. But he came to me anyway. 
And Jesus heals this blind man, this outcast, this nobody, this nothing, this beggar. This one that, that the religious authorities would just throw away. And in fact, they threw him away after he served them no good purpose. But there was Jesus coming to get that lost sheep. That sheep that nobody else wanted. We would call that the black sheep, the sick sheep, the frail sheep. We figure, you know what, he's going to die anyway, just leave him be. But that's who Jesus comes and he saves. And he uses that. Remember he tells his disciples, this man was born blind that God may be glorified in him. He says something to that effect, right? And we see it happening right here. Jesus takes the castaways of society and he takes the, the less than ordinary and he makes them extraordinary for his glory and for our good. But they couldn't see that but we see it. We see it here in the words of Christ and the actions of Christ. This man says, I don't know if he was a prophet or he's a bad guy, a good guy, whatever, but one thing I know, I was blind and now I see. And that's what he's done for you and I, beloved. We were once blind, but now we see. And we, amen, that is amazing grace, which shows us the love of the good shepherd. He is the glorious shepherd, beloved. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. And once again, I say, he proved it by going all the way to the cross for you and I. No one will ever do that for anyone, but Jesus did it for you. Praise be to God. Amen. So let's look at our three spiritual takeaways for the verses before us. And the first is this. Jesus, the good shepherd, is faithful. Therefore, we can trust him. We've seen him be faithful all the way to the cross. So, beloved, you can trust in him. Jesus, the good shepherd, is God with us. Therefore, we have security in him. It's not just like some man died for us. No, this is God in the flesh who died for us. And he was raised from the grave on the third day according to his own power. And he is seated on high at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Our shepherd is a glorious king. Therefore, we can have security in him. And finally, Jesus the good shepherd loves us. Loves us with a deep abiding, a perfect love. Therefore, we can live in complete peace. Praise be to God for that. Amen. And if you haven't believed in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, today is a new day to do that. Today is a new day to forsake yourself, to forsake everything in the world that you have believed in that has led you astray from Christ. Today is a new day to trust in Jesus, to come before him and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. I know and I trust that I can't save myself. I can't do for myself what you did on the cross. And I believe in you and I choose to follow you this day and forevermore. Beloved, I believe if you say that in your heart and you confess it with your mouth, that you will be saved, as the scriptures say, and you will be strengthened and you will be you, you will be invigorated to go and live out your life by the guidance of the good shepherd. Beloved, let us trust in the beautiful, the good, and the true of our shepherd. Amen? Amen. Well, would you join me in prayer? Our holy Father and most gracious God, we praise you this day and we thank you, Father, for sending the good shepherd. We thank you that Jesus was not good by human standard, but he was good by your standard, O oh God. We thank you that he is loving, that he is true, that he is altogether glorious. And we praise you, Father, for sending him for us. Bless this reading, this exposition to our lives, O oh God, that we may remember it all the days of our life. For we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>